Number 19, Baylor, men's basketball, falls at home to number 17, TCU, 88 to 87. Baylor falls to 10 and 4 overall, 0 and 2 in conference. On the bright side, they also signed a five star recruit today. So, quite a dichotomous day in Baylor athletics. This is Locked On Baylor. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As you can see, I am not your normal host, Drake Toll, but I am joined by a friendly face and Cameron Stewart. My name is Brandon McKinnon, filling in for Drake today, who was too sad to pod. Um, he admitted that, said he was too sad to pod. Um, but unfortunately, you are stuck with me. Fortunately, you get to be with Cameron. Um, Cam, I don't know, awesome. man. The viewers, I think, will flip that around. I think they will flip that around. Potentially. Um, Both of us are sad. Um, this, is, this is bad. It's a bad it's day. Bad. It's a sad day. It's a very sad day. And um, it really like, started well. It did. It started really well. We thought that <laughs> 2023 was trending to be the year of the bear again. Um, maybe not because of the loss at Iowa State on New Year's <laughs> Day. But um we'll get to eve's missy that's the bright side of today let's start with this game um baylor <laughs> opened up extremely hot Keontae showed why he was him like we've been talking about starting three for three from three scored our first nine points was talking as much trash as he deserved to talk and at one point baylor was up by 17 points with five points left in the first half <laughs> um and from there it was all downhill cam what'd you see you were there yeah, yeah, I, Keontae, honestly, I thought he was pretty darn good start to finish. Uh, there was a couple minutes, like the first half of uh, the second half, he didn't have a field goal attempt. But Baylor didn't hit a field goal for nine minutes in the second half, which is just insane. And, and how many I, minutes are there in each half? If you could just, uh, you know, just a remind good me. 20. Mm, they so. hit a field goal just over two minutes into the second half and then did not hit another one till almost the under eight timeout, if that puts it in perspective for you. Um, but Keontae, I tweeted about it down the stretch. He's making the winning plays, like the little plays. He draws the huge charge. He um, at one point grabs an offensive rebound and the corner has nothing to do with it and draws a foul, uh, drew a couple of fouls near the end of the game and went to the free throw line and hit his free throws. And he was just making those little plays that I was like, He's going to be the reason Baylor wins this game. And, it, I mean, it's it's the same old story with this team. There's no – I say there's no one glaring thing you can point to and be like, this is the reason Baylor is failing. I guess you could just say the defense overall. That's fair. Um, it's yeah. been, but, but I think within that, there's so many, like, little things. Um, Scott Drew talked about it in the post game. He said, we're not getting to the rim. And I wanted to add on to that. They're not getting to the rim offensively and they're not protecting the rim. They're not protecting the paint at all defensively. And I'm just not really sure what happened with Flo Thamba defensively. Maybe it's the thing. I mean, Jalen Bridges is a decent defender. Um, but the last couple of years when Flo's looked really good, he's had either Mark Vital or Jeremy Sohan uh, kind of helping his blind side, helping his weak side. And and Matthew Meyer, for, for that matter, who played, I thought, excellent defensive basketball last year. And he doesn't have that this year. They roll out three guards. Uh, one of them isn't 6'8", like Matthew Meyer. And Jalen Bridges just isn't kind of covering up those holes. Not to say he's the, the biggest reason why they're in a tailspin right now. But this, Brandon, this is a defense that won't get you out of the first weekend of the tournament. Like, full stop. <laughs> no yeah. chance. Yeah and, yeah, and I think that that's reality with where we are right now, unfortunately. Um, that's that's the team that Baylor's looked like the last two days, two games, it, for sure. It, and it is. And, and it's real and, competition. And I'm wondering, so I agree with not getting to the rim, and what's so interesting about that is if you remember, it was – I think it was either the Mississippi Valley state or the Norfolk state game when we were both, we were both in Scott's post-game interview. And I think it was either you or Drake called out. We, we shot North of 33s today. And it was the first time or second time we'd done that as a program. And he said, we want to shoot a lot of threes. Well, <laughs> we're doing that. And we shot threes at a decent clip today. 
but Fantastic I find it in the first I, half. Yeah. I find it interesting that he brings up not getting to the rim offensively. And it certainly looked like that was a focus in the second half. A lot of guys, I mean, they drew up yeah. plays even for mid-range jump shots that could turn into a, a look at the rim. The lack of rim protection defensively. I can't, I don't think we can understate how important Jonathan Chamba Chachua's presence is yeah. on the court. I mean, we saw the defense tailspin after his injury last year. We're seeing it this year. It's tough. And I don't think it's for lack of talent or lack of scheme. It just seems like they're overall disconnected. And the foul trouble in this game certainly doesn't help because then it essentially takes away the ability to be physical at the rim, contest shots. I mean, we had flow uh josh and jalen with three or four fouls like for mm-hmm. the entire second half and and yeah. I, I saw a shot chart i was watching at home um i saw a shot chart and tcu was shooting at 70 percent around the rim at one point through the game with like 10 minutes left in the second half it was bad it's just and i said it earlier in that obviously the defense is bad but i look at just kind of the smaller things within it because obviously we've had elite level defenses the last three seasons, especially. Mm-hmm. And so not being that, it doesn't mean you're not very good, but they're just not very good right now. And I'm sure you see it too in that, like the switches aren't there every time or the closeouts aren't quick enough. And so these guys are getting open threes or the miscommunications. How many times did Mike Miles get to the rim tonight? Yeah, I mean, look, Mike Miles is an excellent player. He's genuinely one of the best in this conference. But you can't let him score 33 on you in your building the way he was doing it. It was layups. Yeah. It was layups. The yeah, whole so, night. so let's let's talk about Mike Miles' stat line real quick because I think you bring up a good point. It was a career night for him, career yeah. high in the Farrell Center. From It seemed like a decent environment. Um, it seemed like it, it was a solid was. environment yeah. for a Wednesday night. Um, with no but, students, basically. With no students. But Mike Miles yeah. gave TCU 38 minutes. So he legitimately did not play for two minutes. He was 12 for 21 from the field, three for seven from three, and six for nine from the free throw line for 33 points. If somebody in college basketball scores 33 points, you're assuming they're hitting north of five threes or getting to the stripe mm-hmm. double digit times. No, not really. Mike Miles was just an assassin in the paint and absolutely was a complete headache for us defensively. Nobody else on TCU hit a three pointer except for Mike Miles. Oh. TCU shot three for 14 oh. from three, shot three for 14 from three. He made all their threes and took half of them. Um, and we still lost by one point. If you score 87 points in a college basketball game, again, like you said, 20 minutes a half, 40 minutes a game, quick math for a dummy like me, that means you're scoring two points a minute. A possession is 30 seconds. That means you're scoring at every possession. If you score 87 points, you should win the game. You simply cannot give up 88 points. And Miles was the catalyst to that. Yeah. I mean, I guess we're not UT. We scored 103 and didn't win. Lost by double digits, but um, which that Kansas yeah. State team may boat race us Saturday. I, I'm like, I'm worried about it, man. I really am because I thought after a pitiful defensive performance Saturday and a real lack of effort for most of the game Saturday, last Saturday that we would see like just a classic Scott mm-hmm. Drew defensive performance against TCU, and it was arguably worse, <laughs> arguably yeah. worse. I mean. Uh, Because, again, Iowa State kind of shot the lights out, and I I wasn't kind of sold that that was the big reason why they they lost the game. But tonight, it or, yeah, as as you're listening, last night, it was was layups. And it was just so frustrating. And that last Mike Miles three, which cuts the lead to one, it doesn't even tie the game or put them ahead, I think, like, took Baylor out of it in a weird way. Because then they were like, oh, crap, we have to play offense here. Like, we have to score here. Right. And it was a little rushed, and they don't score. TCU goes down and hits the game winning basket. And it was a good setup on the final possession for Baylor, actually. They throw it to half court to Josh O, who makes a great catch. Which is, Cal- out, is Caleb Lohner available to enter our QB room? This is a I'm, basketball <laughs> podcast, but is he I available? Mean, look, look, any and all options, the kid can sling it a little bit. Yeah, He can sling it a little bit. And yeah. then they draw up a great play and it's just, it's not there. And uh, yeah. And, and kind of one last touch on the, the rim protection um, and, and not getting to the rim. Scott had basically said after the game that 
it was just kind of more important because they went on such long droughts tonight um, that, and, and they weren't getting anything in transition and TCU was just kicking the crap out of them. It was whatever, 23 to nothing in transition points. Like when you can't, when things are totally working against you in transition, you do need to get those easier looks. Like you need to get to the rim at some point. And that's what he said. He says, we don't get to the rim. And when a team beats you in transition, you know, and you're relying on jump shots, you're going to have streaks like that. Nine minute stretch where you don't hit a field goal. You lose a game by a point, right? That That's what's going to sink you. So be interesting to see. I You don't have a lot of practice time or recovery time after a physical game to go up against coach tang on saturday uh they need a humongous effort you cannot be going starting zero and three in the conference the conference you were predicted to win this year yeah with two of your first three games at home right yeah. and it's, well, where have we seen that before yeah in baylor athletics well I'll, I'll let you think about it yeah we'll we'll think we'll think a little <laughs> bit on that one and let the listeners think but no i i mean <sighs> We'll we'll just spend a few more minutes on this game and then close the book on the sadness that that ensued last night. It's I been think painful, dude. It has been painful. It has been these last two months. Extremely painful. Like um, I, I mean, we going to Baylor saw some mid to bad teams, and I know all the old heads are going to be all pissed. Oh, when I was there, they won three games the whole time right, in football. Right. It's like, all right, we get it. They used to be really, really bad, but. The expectations that we had in these last this football men's basketball season and the way one went and one is going, this is painful, man. Yeah, it's very <laughs> two months with football. Like it is the most painful stretch as a Baylor fan that I've had in terms of on field stuff. Yeah. Um, strictly on field. Like it is this is just blow after blow, man. they they will break your heart. Yeah, and I mean, so oh, full full disclosure, if we're ripping back the shade, tonight I was watching the game on my iPad. It's my wife's dad's birthday. We did a family Zoom, watched a movie together. So we were halfway through the movie when Baylor went up 17 points, and I looked at my wife, and I was like, I think we're good. You know, like, I and I literally turned most of my attention to the movie, a nice rom-com. It was a great time. And I looked back, and it was cut to 10 at halftime, and I was like, what the hell? Heck, excuse me, surely we'll turn this around. <laughs> And, and yeah, it was just sad. I mean, let's just run through a couple more stats and then we'll, we'll close the book here and maybe just talk briefly about K state before we get into Eve's Missy. Um, I think if we're looking at the Baylor stats, right, I'm just going to, and I know there's a lot more to this, but I wanted to read these because I think if I read these to you, you're like, we won. So you get, th- you get 27 from Keontae on one of his more efficient games as a Baylor bear for that for those numbers 13 from crier 13 from flagler eight from bridges on two threes who's finally who's been shooting the ball better you have 11 and seven from josh ojanwuna and 21 extremely efficient minutes off the bench going four from five from the field and three from four from the free throw line langston love looked great as well gave you 10 three or four from the field two of two from three in 16 minutes that's really a great spark the question mark to me is why did dale bonner um not play more time he had one foul i don't know if something's wrong he's been our best defender all year you think you put him on mike miles um we shoot 44 percent from the field 45 percent from three 85 percent from the stripe do you think we win we win the rebounding battle i mean all of these things but tcu you got to give credit where credit's due it was a well-coached team got the Mm -hmm. job done was super efficient on the offensive end and seemed to make the back-breaking plays offensive rebounds big defensive stops um, and as much as I really have a hard time watching him, Eddie Lampkin was a difference maker in the paint and really dominated. Um, I think I hand up, I might get canceled for this, but I called him a dollar store Draymond Green and said, I hope he enjoys playing in Italy. Um, and as a Celtics fan, as you know, it's that's going to be something yeah. that'll stick with me. But yeah, that um, those are kind of my final thoughts. I'm ready to turn the page of Saturday. I'll be back in the Ferrell Center. I'm really excited. Um, yes. The good that's news, what's going to get them there. If Scott tells them that in the pregame, I would love, I would that's love big for difference. that to be. That might move the line. It, it, it might move the line. Um, and you know, speaking of the line, great segue. This pod is bar- brought to you by BetOnline.net your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. The line today was Baylor by six. We did not cover. We were on the wrong end of that. Um, betonline.net is should be your go-to place for 
Um, Monday night's game, the national championship game, Georgia, I think currently sits at about a 13 point favorite. Um, Cam, you were doing some research on who people are rooting for asking for folks input. And I said, I'm rooting for Georgia. Why is that? Because on betonline.net, you have the opportunity to build a teaser and tease Georgia down to six and a half to beat TCU by a touchdown, which is what we're looking for. Um, betonline.net is where you can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football um, to college bowl season, which is unfortunately coming to a close NBA college basketball, whatever you want. They've got it all at betonline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can find those on betonline.net as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Betonline.net, where the game starts. Cam, I want to talk Eve's Missy, and we'll do that in this segment. But real quick, let's take two, three minutes. Let's talk Kansas State. Probably five minutes. We're long winded. And what do you think we, we can? What do you think we can? We're but we're both from Massachusetts. Long winded yes. when we talk about sports. Short about everything else, especially our Duncan order. Um, what do you think we can expect, right? So you said not a lot of recovery time, not a lot of practice time. Kansas State has looked like one of the best teams in the conference. Yeah. Perhaps our defensive identity, our in-game adjustments. He's currently on the other sideline. And Keontae, Kansas State's Keontae Johnson, has looked like the best Keontae in the Big 12 so far. What do you think? Yeah. So I haven't seen a lot of Kansas State open book here. I really haven't. Um, but I watched a little bit of their game against UT. And you said it, this Keontae Johnson is the real deal. He, uh, Coach Tang has got him playing with a bunch of confidence. And I think, as crazy as it sounds, thinking back to the preseason, Baylor needs this game to be a dogfight on Saturday. The last couple of years with the Kansas States and the Iowa States and the West Virginias as they've kind of gone downhill, that's what they wanted to do. They said, well, this Baylor team is more skilled than we are. We need this to be a dogfight if we have a chance. Mm -hmm. um, like almost to play down to our level. And Baylor still does, I think, have more talent than Kansas State. I thought they have more talent than TCU. I think they have more talent than Iowa State. Look where that's gotten them so far. So I, I just – I think they do need to just like get in a scrap a low scoring like that Gonzaga game was, if we're being honest, that, that game was a scrap and it looked like, okay, they're figuring some things out here. They're, yeah. they're playing hard and they're playing in a close game against a good team. Maybe they've kind of figured this thing out. And that's, that's just what we'll be looking for on Saturday. I, it might not be the prettiest to watch if it turns out to be that way, but you've got a team coming into your building that just scored 116 points. Yeah. Oh, man. We, we need a win. We need a win. And oh, Keontae, I mean, Keontae Johnson's a great story as well. I mean, he was the player yeah. for those, of, those that don't know. I mean, he was the player at Florida that collapsed. Hmm. Um, people was at his career's over, and it's quite literally been re-jump started in, in Manhattan. And Marquise Noel has looked like potentially the best point guard in America. I mean, truly. Um, so it's going to be a dogfight. I hope it is. I would like to see some heart and effort, but I think it's going to be a lot of emotions in that building and the Jerome Tang homecoming. And, and I hope that it's packed. And I, I really, I hope Baylor gets a win. I mean, most of the guys on Baylor's roster Tang recruited and coached and knows their tendencies. I mean, it's going to be interesting. So need I'm excited to, for need it. Need it to stay in the top 25, by the way. We do. We might be underdogs, which, which you'll it, see a bet online. Be, probably. Yeah. And it's um, great. I mean, I can't, it's been a long time since we've been out of the top 25. Yeah, a long time. Uh, we've uh, been quite blessed the last couple of years. We have, and hopefully we get the win. But let's let's talk about the good stuff that happened today. Let's you and it. I both yes. wrote about Yves Missy. I'm petitioning to try and get him plugged in with Yves Saint Laurent, the French fashion brand you for great? NIL, throw some fits. Oh. I have zero clout, and I told him that very openly on Twitter. <laughs> but I said, if you commit, I will DM the YSL page, which I did. I'm a man of my word. Um, so Eve's Missy, I know that you make Locked on Baylor your first listen every day. So you're hearing this. Yes, but welcome you. to Baylor Nation. Cam, give us a quick rundown. What do you see from Eve's Missy? And we can just talk about his game to close the show. Yeah, I have tried to see a lot of Eve's Missy. There's just not As a lot out there. Yeah. Um, so I have read and watched everything I could on him from the moment he took the visit um, a couple months ago. It was October, I think. And what he is, is like, his ceiling is the best of um, Jonathan Chamuachachua plus Ekpe Udo. 
You know what I mean? So we're going back a little bit there. Yeah. He he's seven foot. So every bit of seven foot tall two over 200 pounds and just an athlete to go with it. So seeing his highlights again, not full games. So take that how you will highlights. Um, he just has a great under, he's super athletic and also has the great understanding of basketball so far, like a great understanding of how to work in the post on both sides of the court. Yeah. And so I think, I think it's important to say that because while we've had some good interior defenders the last couple of years, especially at the center position, like Flo Thamba, I know he's having a tough season, but he's had uh, some great glimpses in the past. Freddie Gillespie was another one. It took those guys a while to kind of learn to play the position at both ends. <clears throat> it took EJ and, a while to do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> I think, weirdly enough, Joshua Jinwuna is learning it very quickly, quicker than I thought um, he would and getting more minutes than I thought he would. And so, so all that to say, those guys were all projects for Scott Drew. He's Missy is not in, in that same sense. He comes in polished as a basketball player rather than just the freak athlete. Yeah. And so this is a guy who already can finish through contact. I know contact is different from high school to college and then to the Big 12. I know it's different, but he's a guy who's used to getting contact and having to finish through it, which is something that a lot of college players, that's a big learning curve for them, um, especially at guard, but also – um in the front court as well so this guy's a legitimate rim protector and freakishly athletic to where he's got a huge wingspan and is going to make plays for you defensively at pretty much anywhere you need him to be as long as he knows where he needs to be on any yeah, kind of defensive yeah. possession he has a chance to to influence a play and in that sense if you are going to get a guy who's a five-star defender um at any position, anything he can give you offensively is gravy. And this kid's got post moves, again, very athletic. Um, and a lot of his highlight tapes, he's he's kind of dribbling through some guys. Don't think that's going to be something you'll see a lot of at Baylor. Uh, it was the same thing with Kendall Brown. All of Kendall Brown's yeah. highlights, he was going like coast to coast. And I was like, oh, man, this is a guard who's just playing forward. It turns out he was a forward um, that could right. handle the ball in high school. Um, so he's me see is the same thing in that he, he's not going to be going coast to coast on these guys, but at least he has that basketball IQ, that basketball sense where he's not like a Rob Williams for our favorite team, the Celtics, where he, he's incredibly efficient, but you don't want him to dribble too much. So uh, it's interesting you say that I actually, in the post I wrote for our daily bears, I actually compared him to Rob from the, from yeah. the little tape which that I we saw, good, which I um, think is a good comparison. I think what was so interesting to me about his game, again, very little tape. We probably watched the same YouTube highlights over and over again and Twitter yeah, videos. There's not a lot out there, man. He, his quick first step either to close out, rotate, or his first jump off the court reminds me of Rob. So for those of for those listeners that may not watch a ton of Celtics basketball or haven't seen any of these Eves Missy um, videos, what's so impressive about and what makes big men stand out as defenders when they're not just bangers on the block is their first step. How can they get in the best position to not draw, not have their opponent be able to draw a foul either on a post up on a closeout because a blow by of a guard is easily a foul on a defender. And I think what you are articulating as well is that everything we've seen is that he closes out under control, can yes. test jump shots as well as gets into the right position in the post defensively. What's impressive. And from some of the things I saw, he's also what you're talking about. He may not dribble coast to coast, but he runs rim to rim and seals. His he's defender. got an incredible motor. Yeah, he, he really does. And that's he something seals that's, his that's defender tough to teach. almost yeah. immediately, which if you seal your defender and that's something that like, I think Flo tries to do, but we just run so much five, four out that he has to screen all the time. But if Eve's Mm -hmm. is sealing, it's basically, Hey, this is an open man right away. Seven foot frame. You can run the offense through there, kick it out. It's going to be great. So I'm, I I think defensively, I I think you put up a great point there with the Rob William thing in that first step and having those instincts. And and what I mean by he's disrupting, he's a guy who's going to be disrupting a lot of possessions without, without blocking a shot or his guy mm-hmm. touching the ball. I mean, it, and we saw it with flow in the past. Um, we saw it a lot with Mark Vidal and Matthew Meyer of yep. guys who you just, you don't see it in the box score because they're not getting a ton of blocks or a ton of steals, but 
the offense around them changes because of how quickly they're getting their guy and how easily they are closing off their portion of the court, this case being the paint. Again, I mean, so much can go wrong in the paint. And uh, we saw it, that. Yes. <laughs> and, and it yeah. And it gets totally, uh, totally um, exposed by these big, slow uh, rim protectors. And if me he's just not that he's instinctual and he's really quick and yeah. he's just going to be, I think, a huge disruptor. Yeah, he's going to be a great fit. And there's talk of him reclassifying. Um, that would be wild. And if he were to that reclassify that 24 class that Baylor's got is stacked right now. Yeah, it's, it's going to be the, it's going to be the number one in the country. I think it um, is with him with him joining. They're currently ranked number one and still in the <laughs> running for Trey Johnson, yes, who's the number one number player one. in the country. Um, Dallas product out of Lake Highlands. And so I think if if Eves does reclassify, can reclassify, that's interesting, right? Because if every day John can come back as even a shell of the player he was, which I think he will only come back if he feels he will be an efficient mm-hmm. asset. Um, him beside everyday John. And Josh Ojanwuna, assuming Josh doesn't leave this year, which if he continues to grow, it could be a Sohan thing where he was the second freshman that comes in, gets a lot of clout. You know, I'm not, I'm just speculating, but that would be an incredibly deep front court if we have Josh, yeah. if we have Everyday John can come back, you know, two years removed basically from the injury and then Eve's Missy, it would be wild. So I think it's going to be interesting to see real quick so we've talked about him as a player and some of the things he's going to bring truly on the court what do you think landing another five star in the class of 2024 means for this program even if you reclassify as a 23 what do you think it says directionally about where baylor basketball is still going obviously it's the right direction but as a true program builder i mean we beat out texas stanford isn't a true like blue blood program but his offer list is extensive what do you think adding another five yard five star player means um for coach drew i mean it's never bad right it, it is it's awesome i mean i'm not to be the debbie downer but these this day and age you never know with the kid committing potentially a year and a half away but but i mean I, I think when he did his visit it was the day after they missed on wesley yates and so it was like on to the next one dude. like yeah that's that's what this program is now and we saw it definitely in the early days of the um, of the one and dones and like the mid 2010s of teams like wanting to make super teams like guys like, oh, I played AAU with this guy. We're both five stars. Let's bo- this guy's going there a lot. Why don't I go there, too? And there is still some of that. And that's that that's the biggest step in Scott Drew's career that he has made was going from the really good to the great in terms of the talent at his disposal. Yeah. You know, back when I was in school, you were bringing Jake Lindsay and King McClure off the bench. And that was just fine. Those were solid players who gave you a lot, but now you're bringing um, Langston love off the bench. Who's been great. These last yeah. couple games, you're bringing I'm... Dale Bonner off the bench. Yeah. When it, we were it's school, just I remember... such a bigger step up. Our big get in the transfer portal, we were stoked when we got Makai Mason because he had just cooked us. Yell had just cooked yes. us before yes. we bring in Makai. And now it's just crazy to be like, oh, no, we're bringing in Jalen Bridges, previous, you know, top 100 crew, Caleb Loner. Like, this is our transfer yeah. portal. And then five and four star guys as, as you know, freshmen and recruits. So it's going to be interesting culture to see. Culture is still there. Yeah, the it's, culture is still there. I think there. a good thing to take away from tell. this because I don't know what this season is about to become. I don't. But that culture is still strong and it's and it's still there. And it's it's a lot tougher to kind of wash away with one season, as I think football is a little bit easier to have that happen. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think I think it's so interesting, right? So if drawing the football comparison, and this will be some closing thoughts here on the future of the the basketball program through the lens of football, if you have a year I'm similar to like this year, but I'm talking basketball. Like last year we get bounced in, you know, the round of 32. It would be very common in football. If a team has a disappointing year to see guys drop, if they haven't signed yet. Yeah. And, and I think that what's different about basketball and speaking to the culture that Scott drew has kept is we didn't see that happen. We saw Keontae stay. We saw Josh stay. We saw us grab huge transfers that are plugs and impact players right away. And, and, and think, we did see one starter leave, and that was a humongous deal. Yeah. Because it doesn't happen. Yeah, it, it doesn't. And so, and normally at every other school, they'd be like, 
eh, you know, he graduated from here, he won a national championship, and kind of did all he could here. It's kind of time. Exactly. And that's what I thought. But a lot of a lot of Baylor fans were just so surprised because it doesn't happen. Yeah, I thought it was time, honestly, for Meyer. And so that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like with Eves committing, and I know you mentioned like a year and a half, we don't know what happens. You know, he's eight, 17, 18 years old. It's a huge decision. I candidly and truly do want what's best for these guys as people first. I think that there's a lot of stuff online where it's like you left or whatever. And that's kind of the Nova Sot thing, but also like what Trace Jackson Davis saw from Indiana today, like receiving hate mail from fans. Like these people are these players are people first and we need to root for that. And so I'm hoping that Eve stays, but ultimately, you know, like you said, I think the culture is the reason why we're retaining this top talent and also going to continue to be successful. So a little bit of an aside, hopefully ending on a little bit more of a positive note, the world is totally not crumbling after a loss to TCU. Um, We have a great opportunity to go and win on Saturday against Kansas state. We signed a five-star in Eve's Missy, who's going to have the best NIL deal in the country with Eve St. Laurent. And just so you know, a regular season record doesn't necessarily drive tournament success, drive seeding, drives whether or not you get in, but the tournament and the national championship is won in March and April. So that's how I'm ending on a positive note. Cam, any final thoughts? Oh, that's it, man. Got to get hot at the right time. And I think it's honestly good that we can't pinpoint one big thing that's getting Baylor in trouble. It's not one injury which means they could just have a game where they figure it out and don't look back. So yep. that's my positive twist on it. That's all I got. If you want more positive twists, Cam, where can people find your stuff? That's at real Cam Stewart on Twitter, which is notably very positive, not at all um, overreactive. Uh, um, uh, actually, I get pretty positive with the Baylor stuff. Now, if it was back to my old like Red Sox Twitter, that would be terrible. But uh, no, it's pretty. Uh, it's a fun time over there. Come see what movies I'm watching and what I think about sports. He's a good follow. Walk uh, walk with him down his 200 new movies this year, uh, New Year's resolution. That's I Kim Stewart. I'm Brandon McKinnon from Our Daily Bears. You may get Drake Toll back tomorrow. Hopefully you do because he'll probably um, be just as uplifting as we were if he even talks about this. So thank you for making Locked On Bailey your first listen every day. Again, that's Cam Stewart. I'm Brandon McKinnon from Our Daily Bears. This has been Locked On Baylor.